Welcome back. I would very much like to talk to Laura Manick Firanti, who's a master sommelier who also happens to own Cork Buzz in New York City and has been very much at the forefront of, of this new embrace of Beaujolais. Um, well, you know, in general, Doug, I, I love Beaujolais. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, I, I think it's very hard not to love Beaujolais. And obviously, being a restaurateur and someone that is in New York City specifically, I think um, Beaujolais is having its moment. You know, it perhaps had its moment in, in, a long, in a lot of ways amongst people that really know, but even amongst um, new consumers, uh, they're asking for it by name, which is very exciting. Um, I think some of the myths that propelled Beaujolais um, and helped it with the help of, of course, uh, George uh, was Beaujolais Nouveau. And, and you know, that was very like uh, celebratory and playful. And it was such a great campaign, especially um, just to get the name out there. And then of course, people just thought, well, that's all it is. But that's, I mean, we're talking decades ago, you know, in terms of um, it's, it's, uh, hurting the reputation, that's just not the case. Um, and I think the consumer has been more than educated on that. And, and yet they still sometimes ask for Beaujolais Nouveau around November, which is exciting too. So they, they get that there are all these crews um, and I think they're, they're, they're even sometimes just asking for some of these crews without, you know, I want the crew Beaujolais, they're saying, I want Moulin Avant. You know that's exciting. I mean, I would think for like some of these, um, for some of these crews to just start to become known specifically for their style, it's it's going to be exciting. Do you think that so, there is a, um, a particular reason why younger drinkers seem to be uh, open to these sorts of wines? Sometimes it is challenging, like to get a certain demographic, not necessarily just age, but even people that are used to spending money on wine. You know, I think when we don't have any um, noise in our head about what is or isn't um, something we should be drinking, then that's why they become a little bit more open-minded. So now we're training the next generation that are gonna be like only drinking Beaujolais, right? And they're gonna drive up the price and then we're gonna be like, ah, oh, damn, why do we teach them? <laughs> I mean, that is happening a little bit in New York. It's funny. I mean, it was like, a, it was kind of like, as we started to see some of these like, um, I guess you can call them like smaller wine bar openings and you know they were the kind of like Parisian inspired or Lyon really we should say right because Lyon is is closer to Beaujolais but these like this this uh, sort of um, uh, culture of people just drinking delicious quaffable juicy wines um, then I think New York followed so for sure like the sommelier community had a lot to do with it um, I think the expense of Burgundy proper, we'll call it Burgundy proper, even though Beaujolais is obviously part of Burgundy. Um, but yes, as Pinot Noir from Bourgogne Rouge cost, you know, keep going up, people were like, well, you know, maybe I should drink Beaujolais. And one of the things we're, we're doing is we're asking people like, you know, okay, tell us what you'd like to drink, a budget and a, and a range of bottle, or sorry, how many bottles you want. And almost often, especially now because it's summer, we're, we're putting in wines that people might not have heard of. And the feedback on Beaujolais has been great. I mean, you know, like we'll grill tonight sausage and peppers. It's like, what more could you ask for? <laughs> we're definitely opening like Julianas <laughs> or Senamore or something, you know, that's in between these smoky kind of red wines that are, you know, for the most part unoaked, you know, or don't show oak, I should say, and have such minerality, but such freshness such fruity nature, but, but let's not dismiss the fact that they're structured. I mean, there's plenty of acid, there's plenty of mouthfeel and, and the minerality is really strong. Yeah, I mean, what I love about Beaujolais and especially when we get into the cruise is, you know, I, I would say, you know, some are red fruited, some are black fruited but the fruit is always um the perfect amount of tart and ripe like it's never sour and it's never not even close to being overripe and i don't really know how many other places can get that really like picture perfect fruit 
without it being cooked, not dried, not jammy, um, not even, you know, I love Italian reds, but right now, like even those sometimes can be, and that's their strength, sour, you know, really restrained and, and like, you know, so this is, I think it's showing a lot like that. It's, it has so much aromatics, which is incredible to me. I mean, there's a little bit of like the dried purple flower. Um, I think the strongest thing would be like that, that black rock, like the smoky, um, silty, peppery. And, 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 you know, then you get that really nice fresh herb, like that just kind of lifts everything up, which I really enjoy, especially from Bruyere. I, I find like, I always get like, I wouldn't say sage cause it's not a sweeter, but it's, it's, it's definitely, um, not vegetal, but really nice, strong herbal, uh, essence. I think, I mean, these are definitely food wines for, for just, everyday consumption. This is what I love about this conversation about Cruz. Um, mm -hmm. This is really interesting because this is completely different aromatically. Um, Cote de Bruyere, so more steep. Um, and, and actually this is the 18 too. Um, and a smaller Appalachian, not the smallest, but almost the smallest. I think it's the second smallest, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and this is interesting because I, I don't think I would blind this as Beaujolais. I mean, the color alone is like very light. It's like um, sometimes people will think that like Beaujolais has to be like that dark purple color. Um, but I've seen more and more like um, ruby, elegant, kind of like light looking Beaujolais, which I appreciate, of course, depending on the crew. But this one is extremely high tone, like really very floral. It's like, it smells like elevation, which would make sense with Cote de Brie. And then you get that volcanic minerality. It's hard to say that. I think the fruit is like slightly underripe, like not in sour on the nose, but it smells like a, like a blueberry that was like uh, picked early. And it's got like plum skin and it almost has like a, a really intense, like, yeah, I think the common theme is that black, ashy, rocky minerality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely some, I think the, the strength of Beaujolais Crew is the palette even more so than the incredible things we just talked about on the nose. It's like, I don't know, how many people are you going to give that to that are going to be like, I don't like that? <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. <laughs> like in, in being... It has a point of view without, so without being one way or another, which is to say, unless you want a fruit bomb, unless you want tons of tannin, unless you want a full body wine. But I mean, I'm talking straight in the middle, like people that like Pinot Noir, people that like Barbera, people that like Dolcetto, people that like don't know any of those grapes and just know that they like a red wine that they can put in their cooler bag and have with a burger or hot dogs which I actually think would be really cool. Like some of these wines, you know, you have, you have like hot dogs and you're just like, wow, it, it kind of smells like, like this meaty, almost like charcuterie thing, which is probably why it goes so well with wine bar, bistro kind of food, like when you're picking. It's interesting. It's like almost like the lighter version of the other one. Like Cote de Bruyere is like somewhat more, steep, elevated, lifted, and the Bruyere is a little bit more like still in the two categories. It's still broad and big, um, but it, it's not, um, it's, it's like its older brother in this case. Thank you for watching. When you come back, we're going to talk to Romain Teto and learn a bit more about the DeBuff family.